Well, my friends, you may have uh, seen in the E! News that I will be doing a sermon series during Lent, um, Glimpses of Lent in Art and Conversation. And so uh, there's two pieces to that. The first is that we will be exploring some art every week um, as part of our sermon time, but also the scriptures uh, each week in this um, lectionary cycle are all conversations that happen in the text. I discovered that um, just prior to the pandemic. And so I don't know if you remember, but we had like two weeks where we got to do this really cool thing of reading the scripture together as conversations. And then we went online. Um, and so I just have decided to resurrect, ah, what an Easter term, um, this, this way of reading scripture together for the season of Lent because it's very powerful to encounter these scriptures as they were intended, which, was, which are as conversations. Um, so rather than have me just simply read the whole thing to you, I'm going to invite you each week to come on up. I have the scriptures all printed out, color-coded and everything for the different parts, so that you could come up and read the scripture as a conversation. So this week, I need three volunteers. One of you will be the narrator, the other of you will be Jesus, and the third person gets to be Satan. <laughs> so Carol, come on up, Adam, come on up, and I need one more, and Peggy. You guys get to argue amongst yourselves who gets to play who. <laughs> so who's gonna be who? You'll be the narrator. That's in black. Okay. I don't know. Uh, just, just Satan is purple. Jesus is green. And I need for you to speak right into the microphone so that everyone at home and here can hear you. So you are green. Anything that is green, you can read. So this comes from Matthew in, the chapter, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And to help the ease of the conversation, a lot of our scriptures will be coming from the message, which is a modern version of scripture. And take it away. Next, Jesus was taken into the wild by the Spirit for the test. The devil was ready to give it. Jesus prepared for the test by fasting 40 days and 40 nights. That left him of course, in a state of extreme hunger, which the devil took advantage of in the first test. Since you are God's son, speak the word that will turn these stones into loaves of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. For the second test, the devil took him to the holy city. He sat him on top of the temple and said, Since you are God's son, jump. The devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91. He has placed you in the care of angels. They will catch you so that you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. For the third test, the devil took him on the peak of a huge mountain. He gestured expansively, pointing out all the earth's kingdoms, how glorious they all were. Then he said, They're yours, lock, stock, and barrel. Just go down on your knees and worship me and they're yours. Jesus' refusal was curt. Beat it, Satan. <laughs> he backed his rebuke with a third quotation from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only him. Serve him with absolute single-heartedness. The test was over. The devil left and in his place, angels. Angels came and took care of Jesus' needs. Amen. Give them a round. Yes. Yes. Awesome. 
Thank you very much, my friends. I appreciate you doing that. It is uh, different to hear the scripture read in that manner. And so today especially, we're going to be talking about those voices in the wilderness, those words, sounds that come to us when we are struggling and to, to Jesus uh, in the story here. And so as we encounter these first bits of art, I want you to be thinking about what voices in the wilderness did Jesus hear? Where did those voices come from? And how do artists depict the conversation? It was very interesting to listen today to hear Satan's voice be read by a woman, right? Yeah. And Jesus' voice to be read by a woman. I bet we don't often think of that. So I, have, I had a hard time. I couldn't pick just one piece of art for today. So there's a se there's several. Um, and those of you who have been with us before when I've done this sort of thing, um, this is, this is, there's no wrong or right answers when I ask these questions. When we encounter the art, it's just tell me what you see, um, and we'll encounter it together. Um, and my question, though, for you is to really be paying attention to how artists depict the conversation. With whom is Jesus having this conversation? What is the voice coming to him? And so uh, just in my first slide is a painting by James Tussaud, Jesus Tempted in the Wilderness. We just start by telling me what you see. And somebody, yes, thank you, Faith, for describing to Juanita. What do you notice about the painting? He's in a cave. Right? So the artist depicts this conversation happening in an enclosed space, right? Sort of high up, right? Looking down into the valley, right? So the location. What else do you notice? A lake. The light beaming in. It looks like a beggar. So the, the description of Satan in this image is of an old person, right? barely dressed, holding the stones, right? We read that. Holding the stones for Jesus. Sort of dark, contra contrasting to Jesus' robe, which is white, right? Okay. So, um, so one of the things that was really capturing my attention was how uh, the artists portrayed this conversation. So here, Jesus is not talking directly to Satan, right? He's facing who? Us, right? Talking to the side, as if to say, the reality that I want you, the um, viewer, to see is me. And this is just sort of a distraction over here, right? Okay, next one. This comes from uh, the early in the 14th century, uh, The Temptation of Christ on the Mountain by a Gothic artist. And so in uh, the medieval times, there was this transition to how artists began to depict Satan. So Satan in the Bible is um, really a part of God's court. He, uh, Satan has a job, like in the book of Job. They're having this conversation, God and Satan, and Satan saying, you know, take a look at humans. They're not as, you know, good as you think they are. Um, and so he's, Satan is really kind of the um, prosecuting attorney in God's court. Here, though, in medieval times, there was this real transformation in the sort of magical, fantastical imagination um, for people for what the devil or Satan looked like. And so it started to take on a very concrete, repetitive kind of image of like a scaly kind of being. Um, when you think of the devil in general, what do you think of? Horns, pitchfork, red, tail, right? That comes out of medieval times. The Bible doesn't ever say that anywhere. <laughs> That's how... Uh, the devil looks, but here uh, this artist is showing the sort of gothic um, representation of the devil. Um, and so just getting that out of the way, what else do you see in the picture? What do you notice beyond him? The light coming through on one side, right? Jesus and the angels have all the light, and there's darkness on the other, right? 
wings. Yeah. So he's kind of an otherworldly creature, right? So the other one was just sort of uh, an old man. He was pretty typical, right? So think about the voices of temptation in, in your ear, maybe, as we go along as well. What representations do they carry? You know, do you have the little devil sitting on your shoulder? Or is it more, is it more esoteric than that? Or can, the, can Satan arrive just looking like an ordinary thing? Um, the other interesting thing to note about this painting is, um, so this is sort of in reference to a couple things. This is a detail, by the way, of a much, much larger painting, um, and the, the effect is, is more dramatic in the full thing. But you'll notice that this is the point in the conversation where um, Satan is tempting Jesus about the power and principalities, right? And so all of the castles and whatever, it's almost like he's standing in like this like little miniature village of toy castles or whatever, right? Because the power that God talks about and God, you know, encourages us about has nothing to do with that kind of power, right? And so that's all minimized in the picture because that's not the power that God wants us to have. It's the power of God's grace and love in the world, right? And so this is also definitely referring to the Matthew um, story. Not every gospel includes this, but Matthew does, that at the end of the story, who are the other voices in the wilderness for Jesus? The angels. The angels came and waited on him, right? One more, another, there's two more, but the next one I found fascinating. What do you notice about this one? This is by uh, Titian, Titian from uh, 16th century. What? I can't hear you, so speak up. <laughs> the devil comes in many forms. That's a young man. Doesn't look at all threatening, does he? Like a child. Gentle, right? He is, he is, but you can't see it very well, but he's holding his tone um, to Jesus. But isn't that interesting? Why would the artist want to use that image? I don't have an answer to that, but <laughs> it's a great question, right? How, do, how are artists depicting the voices in Jesus' ear? Mm, yeah. Well, and I also, all right, so when we get older, right, are we not tempted to hearken back to our youth, right? The way things used to be, you know, the older I get, the more I'm like, my body, I feel like my body is still 18, but it is not. <laughs> so I am tempted to not embrace the changes that are going on, right, that I think of myself as a young person. And Jesus is saying with, what's Jesus saying with this? Having a conversation with somebody and I do this. Gasping. <gasps> Maybe. I don't see a look of shock on his face. He's pretty darn serene. I don't know if I'm serene in the wilderness. But Spock. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, it's, all, it's like the opposite of Spock that he's doing. I don't know. <laughs> right, but this is my, this is me and my, right? So temptations come to us to try to convince us to be somebody that we aren't, right? So Jesus is saying, this is what I think. This is my God. This is my faith. This is where I stand over and against the temptation, right? Okay, one more. This one I showed you, I think, last year. Britain, Rivier, the temptation in the wilderness, right? Where's, where's, who's he talking to? Hmm. Yeah, right? For most of us, right, where are the temptations? We don't, you know, I don't ever have the devil just kind of pop up <laughs> next to me in temptation. It's all internal, right? So this artist is de depicting this um, very internally, and what is the impact on Jesus. He's not sitting there serenely, so confident of his point of view, is he? What's, what's going on? 
He's disturbed, tired, tired. Defeated. defeated, struggling, sad, hungry. It's been 40 days, y'all. <laughs> alone a no grass right nothing green it's barren desolate is a wonderful phrase word for this picture yeah yeah so so think about the voices in the wilderness where do they come from what do they sound like who holds them for you the journey of lent you can go on to the, my next slide thank you the journey of Lent always begins in the wilderness, right? In those places. And that last image of Jesus says it, says it all, right? When we are in wilderness, it drains us. It makes our shoulders to slump and challenges our sense of sufficiency in the world. Dante Alighieri, in his Inferno, writes it this way. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark. For the straightforward path had been lost. In the text, the Spirit takes Jesus and leaves him in the wilderness. And we might presume that Jesus didn't want to go. Who would? But it's where the Spirit sends him, knowing that this is where he needs to start. Before he's done anything in his ministry, this is where he's driven. And so today we, consider, we gather together to consider the ways of the wilderness, this iconic metaphor used repeatedly throughout the Bible, right? Like the Hebrews who wandered for 40 years in it and found themselves doing crazy things like making golden calves and wishing they were back in Egypt. That's what the wilderness does to you. Like the Israelites in captivity in Babylon, weeping for everything they had lost. Lamentations, you read those words, and wilderness, awful. Like the disciples shut behind locked doors, cowering in fear and disappointment after Jesus died. The image of the wilderness fills the imagination with uncomfortable things. The wilderness is a place of disorientation and discomfort, a place of raw honesty and naked vulnerability, a place of fear and temptation and doubt, and where, if we're honest, we can confess just how messy our lives can be and just how lost we are in it all. And there are two figures who show up in the wilderness in this story, two voices who speak into the wilderness to Jesus. One, of course, is the tempter. In Hebrew, the Hasatan, I'd say that on purpose, who has a particular role in the stories of the Bible, which I just told you about. He's the one who's questioning the state of humanity, the prosecuting attorney in the heavenly court, whose job it is to prove just how weak humans are, these creatures made in God's image, but who don't ultimately stack up. In our text today, it is this Satan who comes to challenge Jesus, whose voice whispers in his ear. And he does so in a subtle and crafty way by tempting Jesus to try and prove who he is based on Satan's expectations. If you are the Son of God, he says, then turn these stones into bread. Right? People are hungry. You're hungry. You could do it. Go ahead. If you are the Son of God, do this, do that. Tempted with abundance and power, Jesus is challenged to decide who he is and to live it, who God is calling him to be, no matter what comes, even if it isn't fame or glory, wealth or success. If you are the Son of God, then you must be like this, is what Satan is telling him, right? How often do you hear that? Well... If you are a good wife, then you will. If you are a man, then you will. Fill in the blank. If you are Christian, then you must. Hmm. Well, this week I had an epiphany regarding this story and the church as a whole. Not just us as particular individuals who have all sorts of temptations we face every day. 
it occurred to me that the church as a whole is just as tempted to identify itself in something other than what God intends. Listen to the words again and see if these temptations sound familiar. If you are the church, then you will have large numbers of people in your pews. If you are the church, then you won't have to worry about who's going to do what. And if you are the church, you'll have an amazing preacher, the most talented music director and musicians. Well, of course, that last part is true. But the fact of the matter is, if you are the church, then you have only one thing to do that may or may not result in glory and fame and riches beyond telling or filled pews and countless volunteers. One thing to do. You must locate your identity in God and God's calling for you rather than be tempted by some external source of a barometer telling you if you're doing it right. Jesus could have done any of the things Satan said, but he didn't. That was not what God intended for him to do, to prove he was worthy by someone else's standard. His job was to be and to become the one God called him to be. And that identity, let's be clear, was fraught with risk and going against the norm an immense sacrifice. So why do we as a church think that all of this is supposed to be easy and comfortable and not at all challenging to what we think or do or believe about ourselves? But the thing is, I said earlier, there are two characters who show up in the wilderness, two voices that whisper in Jesus' ear. One is the tempter, the other is the angel, right? At the end of the text, it says, angels, suddenly angels came and waited on him. So Lent takes us deep into the wilderness, full of insecurity and burden and misdirection. But all along the way, the trail is marked by spots of respite, where the angels stopped to wait on us, didn't they? Think about it. The thank you note that gave you a burst positive energy at just the right time. The tissues passed to you and piled up and wet in the company of a comforter. The love poured out in a voicemail message. The friend who offered forgiveness and understanding. The person who told you just how much your ministry to them mattered. The voices of angels always remind us that God has called us beloved, that we matter, that we are loved, and that there is hope because of all of that. I'm reading a book by Todd Bolsinger in which he tells the story of Sister Madonna Buder, otherwise known as the Iron Nun. What a great name. She got this unusual nickname because of her prowess as an Ironman triathlete. In 2012, Sister Madonna became the world record holder in her age group and the oldest person at the age of 82. I'm letting that sink in. Just looking at you. Looking at you. At the age of 82 to complete the 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike ride, <laughs> and 26.2-mile run that make up an Ironman triathlon. <laughs> I love you, Tilsa. <laughs> well, Sister Madonna was invited to speak some words of encouragement to her competitors the night before the race. And she said this, Tomorrow, when things get tough out there, remember, you were loved into existence. 
If you get discouraged and you want to quit, if you get injured and can't finish, if things don't go the way you hope, even though you have trained for this day for months or even years, even then, remember, you were loved into existence. I'm looking at a church of seniors in a lot of cases. Some of you are younger than 82. Some of you are older than 82. But this is the content and context of our good news, my dearly beloved. This Lent, every time you come in this place and wonder about the future, try to let the tempting voices go. And then listen for the still, small voice of God telling you that you were loved into existence. First Baptist Church, whatever challenges you feel and face, even when they feel like you are slogging through an Ironman triathlon, you were loved into existence. And when we trust that truth and live into it with all that we have, if we do it faithfully, then we'll know we are the church that God dreams us to be. And then, like Jesus, you know what? We go out from this place with angels whispering in our ears. We find ways to share God's kingdom, love, grace. Come near. Amen? Amen.